Howdy, Team 42. It's your skipper here, Darius Dell, to present another episode of our Pro to Pro Live. I'm joined by our friend, Bob Elliott, a founder and CIO of Unlimited Funds. How are you doing today, Bob? Good, good. How are you doing? Dude, it is a pleasure to have you back on the program. I was just uh, singing your praises in the uh, in the pre-production. You know, I have this big like list of folks that I follow on Twitter, and I don't really spend too much time on Twitter these days. Most of the time I spend on Twitter is interacting with our uh, private Twitter community uh, our, of, our, of our clients. And when I do get, you know, five, 10 minutes a day to kind of scroll Twitter, you are in this very, very narrow list of people that I actually actually get to scroll and appreciate their comments. So I just want to say thank you for all the education that you're providing. Uh, oh, well, they, thanks for awesome. reading. Love, love all the uh, interaction with folks out there. You know, the, the, the sort of uh, quiet little secret is I, I get uh, as much out of uh, everyone's comments and thoughts probably as, uh, as people are getting out of it. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great two way, two way street for me. So I appreciate uh, any of the reading. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, if you do Twitter, right. And I'm not sure that everyone is doing Twitter, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> intent. But if you do Twitter, right, there are really thoughtful folks on there. Um, the really thoughtful people asking really thoughtful questions in response to like tweets and things of that nature. And it's, you know, it certainly hasn't replaced the institutional client meeting, but it is a very robust, you know, set of actors and agents out there with all, you know, similar concerns that allows you to kind of get what everyone cares about. I don't think it's a good tool for measuring sentiment or measuring, you know, kind of yeah, yeah, that, but it's, but it's good, you know, to, I mean, part of the whole, well, you, you must appreciate this, like part of the benefit of writing out your ideas is that it helps crystallize them. You get feedback, totally. you get questions that pushes you forward and forward and forward. And if, as you say, if you do it right, you can really get a lot out of it, a lot out of it uh, relative to, you know, what you put into it. It's just, you have to, you have to do it right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to say congrats on your success. Obviously, we didn't get together to chat about Twitter. Uh, we got together to chat about, A, your market views, uh, what you're doing over to Unlimited. So if, uh, let's start with the, the latter first. Sort of give us a little bit of a background of kind of your firm. I think you're doing some uh, revolutionary stuff in terms of uh, the, the products that you guys are creating uh, at Unlimited. And just uh, give me a little bit of background of you, what you guys are doing. Uh, that'd be great. We can start the discussion that way. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the background about me, for those who... You who don't know, I, I've spent about 20 years as a systematic investor. I was a Bridgewater Associates for a long time, uh, as well as running $125 million uh, systematic venture fund afterwards and sort of realized through that time that, that you know, two and 20 businesses, which are like hedge funds and venture and private equity, are really good at generating returns, but they're also really good at charging high fees, which means that, you know, most investors aren't that much better off. Uh, and the reality is that, you know, many investors are even locked out of the access to those returns. And so um, that got us to, to start to think about uh, starting a few years ago about whether there was a way to bring the concepts of sort of diversified low cost indexing, which obviously totally changed stock and bond investing and bring those same ideas to the world of two and 20. Right. Because uh, and 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 those you know the basic idea is saying look if we can if we can do a pretty good job replicating the sort of strategies and positions that these you know various managers have on or these strategies pursue but we can do it using technology instead of you know paying star pms and things like that we can um you know we can do it in a much cheaper way and we can also take that understanding and uh, translate it into positions in liquid securities that we can use to back structures like ETFs where, you know, uh, which are much more tax efficient, liquid, transparent for the investor, but also really give every investor access uh, to the returns, right? If you, you know, the basic idea is if you want, uh, you know, if you have 20 bucks and you want to get access to hedge fund style returns, like you should be able to do that, right? The, those sort of strategies shouldn't be only available for the most sophisticated or institutional investors. And so uh, that's what we've been doing. We we started about 18 months ago. We we uh, we launched one product, the HFND ETF, um, and now we're you know working through that vision to build a whole suite of different products uh, out there on the market. Well, I appreciate what you're doing, man. You uh, you very much uh, embody the spirit of democratizing institutional finance that we embody uh, here at 42 Macro. And I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. Uh, obviously, you have your flagship fund HFND out there. You said you're working on a few other products as well. Uh, does it be coming out shortly? Is, is that is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the basic idea that we're trying to do is sort of give people the tools, the various tools to be able, you know, across the two and 20 spectrum, whether it's, you know, uh, individ more, more sort of 
individual strategies in, in the hedge fund space or more broadly across 2 and 20, things like liquid venture capital, private equity, things like that, that uh, could give you know the everyday investor access to those tor- sorts of returns that they don't really don't have access to today. So well, that's it's, not, what, you know, it's, it's not even just the everyday investors. It's institutional investors that can't. It's, yeah, I mean, even even a modestly sized institutional oh. investors aren't don't necessarily have access to the to the very best top tier you know hedge fund products and things like that. And so, um, and, and even if they do, the then expensive. right, they have to pay you know very very high fees and things like that. And so, you know, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for the broader set. Uh, you know, this this sort of this vision of in the same way, you know. Vanguard and Vogel, et cetera, created much better access at much lower cost to the world of, you know, stocks and bonds for investors. So too should, you know, basically the same sort of thing happen with two and 20 style investments. So that's what we're really focused on. Got a lot of exciting things coming up and, and that we're really looking forward to. Well, I'm really looking forward to them. I've been really watching your success from afar, man. It's well-deserved. Uh, you're hardworking man and really bright guy. I'm super excited to kind of get into your uh, your market th- thoughts as well. Uh, the last time the guy in the black shirt and the guy in the blue shirt <laughs> got together on this program, both of us were singing the praises of transitory Goldilocks back in early. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, you know, without even taking a victory lap, that's just what happened in markets for primarily for the most part, at least throughout the first half of the year. Uh, into July for the equity. Market. Yeah, there's that little hiccup with SVB, but then it basically, you know, it basically reversed, right? <laughs> hiccup isn't a perfect um, way to describe it. And, and, and you know, and, and appropriately so. It, it actually, no, it's not a perfect way to describe it. That was a, lati- a very material market event that we had to sift through in terms of analyzing the data, you know, the credit data after in, in the wake of in the aftermath of that, analyzing the market signals to understand that, hey, this is something that looked like it was going to get really bad, but then started to get less bad uh, as soon as uh, April uh, in terms of our some of our signals. Uh, but even looking beyond that, you know, this year is largely played out in terms of our, our previous discussion played out. And, the, and that discussion, for those who missed that, uh, is available on our, on our 42 Macro YouTube channel from back in January. We sit here today in the fall of 2023 with a very different market environment and what looks to be a developing very different economic environment as well. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I think um, I, I, I think you know if we go back a year ago, kind of everyone, uh, at least sort of the conventional wisdom was we were going to have a recession relatively quickly. And I think you know part of our conversation about transitory Goldilocks was looking at it and saying, uh, I'm not sure that that's actually going to play that that's ex- what's going to happen in the immediate, mm-hmm. right? Which is um, and that's you know the economy has remained relatively robust. Uh, or certainly hasn't moved into a recession over the course of the last, you know, nine or 12 months. I think the thing that has started to shift is, and, and this is kind of classic in a, in a macro cycle is that um, sort of everyone has given up on the possibility of recession just as sort of the storm clouds are gathering. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I wrote in late July, I said, you know, it looks like we've reached really peak, uh, you know, really, really peak view of, the no landing, soft landing uh, scenario. I think it was when the Atlanta Fed GDP now number came out and it said six percent, and everyone was passing that around and are basically saying, "Well, we'll never have a recession again." Uh, you know what I mean? And I said, ah, "I don't think that that's right." Like certainly the expectations at that level are relatively extreme, but on top of it, um, I think you know time and uh, you know macro cycles take time. They just take a long time to play out, and and I think those of us. Uh, who have studied them sort of recognize that the idea that it would take a few years to go from sort of the peak to the trough is totally normal. And if anything, this cycle is moving a little slower. And so, but that doesn't mean that we're not moving in a direction. It just means that it's, we're moving in a way that a pace that's probably slower than most people imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what would you sort of contribute that slower pace to uh, in this particular business cycle? And secondarily, is there something that may speed that pace up uh, in the coming months, if not quarters? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the the main the main story is that the you know probably folks who are regularly listening to you have have heard the the tale of how you know the U.S. economy is just a little less sensitive to um, to to tightening uh, as a function of the significant liquidity and the terming out of borrowing. 
which has meant that both households and businesses are just less sensitive to the incremental initial hikes um, that uh, that the the Fed has done. And so, I, you know, that's that's basically the story. Although, you know, I, I think there's some nuance under the hood uh, that we sort of saw basically really in early 2024, a confluence of I'd almost call them like sort of mini a couple of mini stimulus uh uh dynamics it's not, not even measures because i'm not sure they were so explicit in nature but like you know in early 2024 you had a relatively sizable um uh adjustment to the to the um uh, based on the cpi oh, yeah. right yeah. for social security yeah. recipients there was a reduction in the tax bracket an effective reduction in the tax brackets because the cpi numbers flowed through there was a delay in california and other states you know tax returns there was you know there's so there's a series of things that probably no one of which was that influential but you kind of like it added when you added all the numbers up you're kind of like oh well that's like you know a few you know hundreds of billions of incremental money that's going into people's hands that they didn't have relative to the end of 2022 uh, and so that created kind of a mini acceleration in the cycle. And again, that's totally normal in these cycles. You know, cy cycles are nonlinear, right? You know, they're kind of they kind of ebb and flow in a general direction. And you get these sort of mini cycles within the broader uh, trajectory. And so that's kind of what we saw. I think the thing that's interesting on a forward looking basis is that those sorts of dynamics are unlikely to repeat like the CPI has been lower, so we won't have anywhere near as big a social security reset. The tax bracket resets won't be as substantial. Oh, I forgot to mention the IRA, the 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 um, Inflation Reduction oh, Act had yeah, the chip it, early in 2023 had, you know, it wasn't again, it wasn't like huge, but it was just, you know, it just sort of added to the pile that won't, you know, that's basically that incremental stimulus is behind us rather than ahead of us and so we probably won't see that in early 2024 and then of course we have student loans which again on the surface student loans themselves just don't matter that much but they're just another sort of chink in the armor of the economy when you have all these other things that are not likely to to repeat yeah and to, the not likely to repeat it to me is the most important thing i think uh that you said in the sense that these were all sort of one time ish type phenomenon that we observed in the economy uh, Colin, if you can um, uh, throw slide 52 up here on the screen from our October uh, 2023 macro scouting report. And Bob, and we'll just walk through a lot of what, what Bob just said here in terms of putting some, some numbers around this. So uh, we had a, a, a several favorable, to your point, Bob, several favorable dynamics. Um, we had the, um, the tax brackets were changed in conjunction with the NCBI. And, and by the way, individual income taxes are about 50% of the federal budget. And these numbers are a year to date, calendar year to date through August. So whenever you see year over year change, it's calendar year to date through August. And so that effectively created a 22% boost to after tax incomes for individuals, you know, for folks who are paying uh, a federal taxes. We also saw a pretty big pickup in Medicare, which is 14% of the budget. That's up 20% year over year. Social Security, which is 23% of the budget up 12% year over year. You know, this is the cost of living adjustment, you know, in play. Um, in terms of uh, pushing uh, uh, billions of dollars into the economy. We also had positive stimulus from the net interest line, which is about 12% of the federal budget up from about 5% uh, in, 2020, in 2020. And that number is growing at about 31%. So we're pumping T-bill interest payments into everyone's you know, bank accounts or, or their, you know, their money market fund accounts. And that's also created some demand. And the summary of all this is that we doubled the budget deficit on a year-to-date run rate basis. Um, it's down 94% from where it was uh, in, 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 um, in in 2022 through um, year to date through August. And so we've pumped about 500 to $600 billion into the economy from the effect of these changes in, 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 in amalgamation. And that is highly unlikely to continue. Not only are we entering a new fiscal year uh, here in October, but clearly it's very unlikely that we see some of these same dynamics uh, in 2024 uh, at the beginning of next year as a function of the cost of living adjustment. Yeah, yeah, I, and I agree. I, I think a lot of these things are um, they're transitory uh, in their nature, right? <laughs> um, I feel yeah. like we should just constantly be uh, saying transitory, <laughs> well, with transitory a little tongue in cheek, and, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, just because we get all get a little chuckle out of how confident can we be? But um, totally. but you know, I think that's that's the that's the basic story. And then you know, we shouldn't discount the fact that we also have had you know 150 basis points of bond yield move up through the second half of the year, which, um, 
when we say that the economy is less sensitive to rates, it doesn't mean that it's no. not sensitive to rates or or that increasing interest rates don't have any effect. It just means that, you know, it's just a little less just because they tighten 550 basis points in a short ter- time frame doesn't mean that the economy is going to collapse. It, but the linkage is still true. It's still a drag on the economy. And similarly with the long end. And in that case, also, I'd emphasize that the time does matter. Because what happens is, you know, if you're a cash flow negative business, you you know, it takes time basically to draw down the savings that you have. So you might not want to issue, you know, issue bonds or borrow incrementally and draw down your cash savings. But at some point, like literally the, the temporal nature of things is such that at some point you then start to run out of capital and you have to either go to the market or you have to really start cutting back. And so the time aspect also matters from that perspective. And so I, I, I think just contextualizing all of this, like the, the typical macro cycle, we've sort of like had these weird macro cycles in the last last couple ones with, I mean, obviously COVID was odd in the sense of it was, you know, acute global shock. And even the financial crisis, we sort of remember the acute part of it, but like, you know, the financial crisis was like 18 months in mm-hmm. um, to the to the slowing of the economy by the time we then got the crisis and it was relatively acute and then we had an acute response. Mm-hmm. And you know, most most folks don't really sort of recognize that these these a typical macro cycle, if you go back, you know, into the 80s and the 70s and the 60s, it's not like there's one thing that like radically shifts the picture on one day. It's like a bunch of stuff kind of like sits as like an accumulating weight on the economy. And it sort of like gradually slows things down, which I know, you know, probably doesn't make for good clicks on Twitter. Like we are experiencing a uh, a grinding slowing of the economy, but it's the reality of how it works. And and I think that's mostly what we're experiencing here. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I'm so glad you, you made a comment that that's, that's really uh, near and dear to my heart, which is it's never just this one thing. Like if it was just this one thing, we'd all be built. You'd be a billionaire star trader, <laughs> billionaire star right. trader. My right. mom exactly. would be a billionaire star trader. Right. Exactly. You'd exactly. Be a security guard. She'd be a billionaire star trader. You know what I mean? Like if it was as easy as the folks on Twitter would prefer you to have it be, or, or the folks, you know, the, the listen to podcasts all day would have it be, then we'd all be billionaire traders. But that's obviously not the case. The reality is the economy is this big, big machine. You know, I, I think your, your former boss over at Bridgewater um, has done some great work and, and you obviously contributed a lot to that work as well. So tip your cap as well, uh, Bob. You guys have done a lot of great work in sort of helping us, you know, mere mortals understand what this machine is. And uh, we've done a little bit of that work as well here. Colin, if you could put up on uh, slide 59 uh, in, in our October macro scouting report, uh, where we show, and so this is, I, I lose retail investors all the time when I say this, so I have to say it slowly, <laughs> which is what you're looking at in this chart, these, these, these five lines represent the median trailing 10 year delta of a basket of select indicators in months before and after recession starts with zero mm-hmm. being the kind of the beginning of, of the recession. And so how, what this chart effectively is showing is how do these different cycles, housing, order, production, profits, employment, and inflation behave in and around a recession, right? You know, what's and based on the collection of indicators that we back tested and looked, you know, there's about five to 12 indicators in each of these baskets. And what we find is that the housing cycle uh, tends to break down around 18, 16, 18 months below, tra- uh, below, based down below trend, 16, 18 months before recession. You got about eight to 10 months in terms of orders, production and profits is about <coughs> six months. And then employment is right around, right on time, right at the doorstep of recession. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, obviously, given the MBR's role in, in dating the business cycle. And then lastly, you have this thing called inflation. But what you find, and this is, this is, these are indicators that go all the way back to, you know, the entire post-war period. So starting in the 1948, mm-hmm. as far back as we have data uh, for, for some of these, um, for some of the indicators represented in these baskets. And what we find is that this kind of makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, like, like, this actually makes a lot of sense in terms of the, not only the economy's, um, you know, kind of the leading and lagging edges of the economy, but also in terms of how the economy responds to interest rates. And we are just kind of the summary of all this is that we've seen a breakdown in the housing cycle in terms of the basket of indicators breaking down below, uh, uh, below trend. We've seen a breakdown in the order cycle. We have seen a breakdown in the production and profit cycle. We have yet to see the breakdown in the employment cycle and we have yet to observe the true breakdown in the inflation cycle as well. So, you know, we're kind of on track in terms of this being a normal business cycle, like going back to what you would I would consider to be a normal business cycle. 
But what I think a lot of investors were wrong footed, particularly at the beginning of this year, when many investors put on that recession playbook way too soon, despite our warning, is because right. they didn't, they're so conditioned to the previous business cycles, which are COVID, financial shock, you know, all, all kind of stuff. That right, happened. right. That happened very, very fast. And, and yeah. you know, you, you wouldn't want to have wanted to wait eight or 12 weeks, like in eight or 12 weeks, they were basically over. A lot of folks were over, a lot of firms were over as well. Yeah, a lot of firms were over too, but it was basically over. And so there's sort of this urgency to get ahead of it in a real way. And I think in in some ways, I think forgetting um, the sort of, uh, when you have a shock, the, the sort of ordering that typically happens in a cycle, which is rates rise first, then that slows down the economy and hurts asset prices and that slow down the economy and asset prices is, you know, self-reinforcing. It's not a spiral, but it's just kind of, it reinforces it's each other, particularly as it then relates, you know, it, it leads to um, a deterioration of the labor market, which hurts incomes, et cetera. Until of course the fed then responds with lower interest rates and it starts to cycle back in the other direction. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of folks, didn't necessarily fully recognize, you know, that we needed to get the whole term structure up of interest rates, right? And before, like, to to be frank, before we were then going to slow the economy enough so that interest rates would eventually fall. And so I think that's one of those time, you know, that timing has been the challenge. Like if you told, you know, I think in some ways, you know, in, in some ways, not you know, not not really like it's it's uh, the the insight that we were going to go into a recession that people had a year ago was not wrong. Like in, in I I believe that that's true. Like we will you know when you have a tightening cycle, that's what happens. Like maybe you can like you know soft landings happen in a very very tiny portion of times, and they can all be hoped for, but it doesn't. It's unlikely that we'll realize them. Mm-hmm. But I think the problem that people had was that they sort of inferred that well, if the recession is coming, then Therefore, I should act as if the recession is here. And the answer is like, no, 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 no. The ordering matters. First, the rates rise. Then the asset prices fall. Then the economy weakens. You know, then bonds and other assets, bond yields start to move down. And that ordering, I think, is confused. You know, it's confused people because people were sort of too far ahead of the of the of the reality of the circumstance and 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 therefore got caught offside in this in this most recent bond move. Absolutely. Speaking of the bond move, you've done a lot of work uh, recently about the backup in bond yields, the, the the sort of the changing, the evolution of the demand in the treasury curve, and also this sort of shock that we've seen in the last few couple of months on term premium. What are your sort of uh, kind of summary thoughts there? We can sort of unpack it as we go. Well, I think the the big picture thoughts is we've we've moved we moved basically from an unsustainable bond market situation where there was you know massive government supply, huge money printing. Um, and very low yields to, I think, a bond market today that looks a lot more, I should also say, and and there was relatively strong growth and high inflation, right? Like that's kind of where we were, if you go, if you roll the clock back 18 months and, um, and that suite of conditions created, you know, through time, a relatively significant up move in the bond yield, right? We, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago when 10 year bonds were like below 150. Yeah. Um, and so, which, you know, it's hard hard to believe, but <laughs> is the reality, right? Yeah. That, that is a, that is a, that is something that has happened before. I mean, just a few years ago. And I think basically, I, I, I think those folks who remain bearish on the bond market are like extrapolating that dynamic at a time when the market composition has radically changed and it's radically changed because the price has changed. And so what's happened is it's true. The fed has gone from buying to selling, right? And the government deficit, well, the government deficit was super high, you know, but the government deficit was super high and will be less high in, in the future on the margin. But the big thing that's gone on is that all of those yield sensitive buyers have started to come in. And so I, I showed a chart on Twitter this morning, you know, yield sensitive buyers, which is just households, ETFs and mutual funds, which are household, you know, direct and indirect purchases. They went from basically zero when bond yields were at, you know, 150 basis points to now buying $1.5 trillion of, uh, of of bonds today, okay. Well, that's a that's a big difference, right? That's a big difference. One point five trillion dollar annualized pace. That's basically enough to cover the the bond issuance necessary for the deficit. Okay. Well, that you know that's a radically different thing, and and that's how and this is how bond cycles work, which is that um, 
which is that uh, the the cure the you know the modified version of the old classic tale the cure for higher yields is higher yields right <laughs> like that's that is the cure right and and it happens almost mechanically that the cure for higher yields is that yield sensitive buyers come in and you see that like even as TLT and price terms has sold off right the the inflows into that into those ETFs have surged um, because investors buy bonds on yield they don't buy bonds on price which mm -hmm. is smarter because yield is better representation of expected return and so we're, we're seeing that play out now we're kind of in a in a in a in a, in a stasis here where you know basically like we can reasonably explain why, you know, it, it, it's reasonable to expect that at roughly these yields, we'll be able to fill even relatively sizable deficits. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I got to find a chart here that is uh, very, very relevant to this discussion. Uh, uh, people like to watch people scroll on, on TV. Here it goes. Uh, Colin, <laughs> if you can put this, um, put this uh, chart up, slide 68 in, 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 our, in our October uh, deck. This chart shows um, the, the Fed funds dot plot, the infamous dot plot that we all hate talking about, but we got to talk about it as market participants. Um, and so we're showing the current year estimates in the first panel, uh, the one year forward estimates of 2024 in the second panel, 25 in the third panel, and then a longer run dot plot estimate. And in the red lines in each of these panels, we show the corresponding December Fed funds futures yield. Um, and so, you know, we got that number, uh, that number's at uh, 539 for the first, or for 2023. It drops down to 458 for 2024 in terms of Fed funds futures yield. Um, we're at 414 uh, in terms of the 2025, the DEEZ 2025 Fed funds futures yield. And they were at 411 for the DEEZ 2026 Fed funds futures yield. Well, I would argue that, you know, the, the bond market was wrong earlier this year in terms of not accepting higher for longer. And I would argue based on our you know, previous discussion from January and the research we've been doing since last summer about the resiliency of the US economy, Investors are just wrong in the timing of the recession playbook. So that's that's one step. What I'm starting to sense now, just by looking at this slide and tell me if you disagree, is that they're now getting too dug in on higher for longer, you know, soft landing, hard landing, whatever it is, or sorry, soft landing, no landing, whatever you want to call it, and not appropriately discounting the fact that, hey, the Fed is telling you they think neutral is at 250. As far out as the 20, these 2026, we're, you know, basically, you know, double that or not double, but 200 basis right. points north of that. That's a, that's a source of potential return in the bond market if we could start to get those numbers down, which will obviously get dragged down by the economy as the Fed starts to react to a recession. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that there's, um, I think the 25s and 26s look a little more interesting than the 24s because I think Agreed. it's about, a, about 100 basis points uh, last time I checked. Uh, priced into into sofers of cuts, seventy five to one hundred. Which you know, there's reasons to think the Fed will be slow and it, they'll take their time. And inflation is and inflation is not really a it, it's not really inflation entrenchment doesn't look like it will be a significant problem over time. But at the same time, they need to remain cautious on that element. So I think it'll probably take them a little while to to get moving, even if growth slows, which is. To be clear, very bad for stock prices. Very, very bad for stock prices, right? Like the idea that the, you know, part of the this idea that the Fed will, at the second that we see slower growth, create a very, very fast cuts, which will support stocks. Like that, that linkage is backwards. Like if the Fed's cutting rapidly, particularly in an environment where inflation is a concern. Like the last thing you want to be doing is holding stocks because the only reason, the only time that they would be doing that if things are really bad. Right, that they would be moving even faster than you know what's priced in into the twenty four curve. But I think the broader point that you're saying, which is, look at the twenty fives, the twenty sixes, and and frankly the overall bond curve, I think is um, is compelling, because I, I think folks, we, if you take for granted or just just take the assumption that we we'll probably will see a res recession at some point, you know, some point in the some point in, some the, point in the near future. Well, certainly at some point in the future. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, in, in let's say in twenty twenty, you just business. take if you. If you just take that and you sort of say, yeah, that's that's the sort of path we're on. That's probably where we're going to go. If you take that as a, as a simple example, well, the question is, how does the Fed turn the cycle, right? How do they turn the cycle? And the way that they turn the cycle is by easing monetary policy. But we've just experienced the fact over the last 24 months that the responsiveness to the tightening has been very muted. Why shouldn't the response to the easing be muted, mm -hmm. right? 
or more muted necessarily than it typically is. And I think for those of us who went through the financial crisis, we we literally saw this, which is the Fed. I mean, the financial crisis, the Fed just kept cutting and cutting and cutting and nothing worked, nothing right? Worked. Because there were other things going on. Now, I'm not predicting we'll have a financial crisis. There are a lot of other things going on. It was like, you know, a relatively extreme event. But that idea that the Fed can be cutting and not get much out of it, like, you know, even if you just go back to, you know, O2, O1 and O2 when the Fed was cutting. And uh, I don't know, you know, for probably not that many people who are watching this remember that, but everyone is sort of looking at each other and saying, why isn't the economy picking up? You know, it, that was recovery. The, 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 the economy was just like, was just not getting enough stimulation. And so if that's the case, then you look at those 25s and 26s and you say, we probably, in order to reaccelerate the economy, have to go below what's in the fours, mm -hmm. you know, that pricing in the fours in order to get enough stimulation in the economy to get the reacceleration, you know, probably down, you know, in, into into a much lower structure, right? Okay. That, that would be my guess. Um, and so why sometimes I say, you know, I've been saying, really since last since the fall of 2022 we're going to have a later but harder recession than most people expect yes. oh, that's music to my ears because I've been <laughs> the thing. It, this because this is an inflationary business cycle and going back to that chart we talked about the mildly one with the delta adjusted z scores the one thing right. we didn't talk about in that chart is inflation is the most lagging indicator of the business it's the last thing it's exactly. the last thing to break down and with the federal reserve acutely focused on inflation dynamics it's highly unlikely that they are going to stimulate early in the recessionary process. And we all know right. monetary policy works with long and variable lags. And so if they start stimulating late, those long and variable lags will kick in late in terms of reaccelerating the economy, which means we are going to contract deeper and for longer than I think the consensus expectation is, certainly when you look at earnings estimates curves. That's exactly right. I mean, I think that's the, the big... That's the big risk is that, um, that, you know, I think the biggest risk and particularly for a traditional investor is like what happens if stocks are falling and bonds aren't rallying significantly enough because the Fed is cautious to ease in response to that weaker, that weaker set of economic conditions. And, and that to be clear, is like pretty normal in an inflationary environment. Now we're not, you know, we're not experiencing inflation like the seventies. And so I, I think those analogies, um, if taken too literally don't make sense, but the linkages, uh, and the, and the sort of behaviors that they elucidate, I think are actually quite useful. And so uh, as an example, like if you look at, uh, some of the cycles in the late sixties and early seventies, uh, and late seventies, the fed actually didn't start cutting until we were nine months into a recession, like halfway through the recession is when the fed starts cutting. Well, that, you know, wow, that's a, that's a totally different environment than what we've experienced, you know, in the more recent cycles where essentially the Fed is actually cutting often ahead of when actual recession occurs. And so we're probably not going to see the second, we're probably not going to see the first, but this idea that it's going to take some time, you know, for the Fed to get the confirmatory signals that they need in order to start cutting is, um, you know, is, is going to be, uh, inconsistent with most folks experience 100 percent rob you've been very generous with your time we got a question and i had you said something that i definitely wanted to unpack for a few minutes would you would you happen to have like maybe five more minutes yeah 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 let's do it absolutely so we'll start with the question then we'll wrap up with uh with the with the statement you made because I, I think it's very worthy of unpacking in the context of these uh, longer term discussions uh, so our friend brian is asking hey brian uh darius and bob for the life of me i don't understand tips uh, will you please provide some guidance into what actually drives these investments and what may make them appropriate now? Ah, uh, tips. I, you know, uh, I, I love tips. Um, talk about tips, you know, no, they, they've been, they've been like the uncool asset class for like 25 years. So uh, I, I love the fact that people are coming back to them. So tips, if you think about them, um, what are they? Uh, a tip is treasury inflation protected security. Um, what that means is that the way that they work is that they offer a real interest rate. They pay a coupon just like a normal treasury bond does. But the way that coupon and the ultimate principle is calculated is that you get a real coupon, a real uh, return or interest rate, and then you get inflation as it actually occurs, uh, as it actually accumulates over time. And so, uh, you know, if you buy a 10-year tip, 
and you have a you know a one percent real yield on it, you'll get one percent each. You know, every six months, you'll get a one percent coupon plus whatever the accumulated inflation is from the time that you bought it to the time that the coupon was issued, and then of course at the end, you get your principal back, the hundred dollars face value of the principal plus whatever the uh, accumulated inflation is. And so I think that's important because what what tips really are are two things. One, it's a long ter- it's a long term instrument that uh, provides the return of actual realized inflation, very important. So it is a inflation protection hedge. But number two is the price of tips just in the same way. Um, I'm sure your, your viewers understand that, you know, bond yields, if yields go up, bond prices go down and the returns are negative and vice versa. The way you think about tips is the same thing, except instead of thinking about um, instead of thinking about the overall bond yield, which includes the real interest rate and the break-even inflation expectations of inflation and the real interest rate, tips prices are only affected by the real interest rate moves. And so mm-hmm. I think one of the things that's challenging with them is what you see is in times when inflation is elevated, typically what happens is the central bank responds with elevated real interest rates to slow the economy. That's actually bad for tips prices, right? Because real interest rates go up, which means the prices of those bonds go down, right? Just at the time when inflation is going up, right? So it's very confusing assets. Like you're protect, you, you claim this is inflation protection, but it's going down while inflation is happening. And that's because they are a real interest rate bond plus accrued inflation. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting in that market is if you think about how how it's going right now, like most of the tightening has been through the real interest rate. When we started uh, the cycle when, uh, uh, back in January 2022 to today, we've had almost 300 basis points of real interest rate, 300 basis points or more of real interest rate tightening, right? That's a huge change in terms of the expected future yield on those, on those bonds. Mm-hmm. And so what that now means is, you know, we're getting mid 2% type real return, which if you look back through time um, on those bonds, is like about as good as it gets. Yeah. Um, in, in the middle of the financial crisis, there was like liquidity issues and they traded into the threes. But I mean, that's what we're, but like, you know, the difference between two and a half and three is like, let's not get greedy here. Like three is basically about as good as it would ever come. And I think those instruments on a forward looking basis, because the real yield is so, so high, so elevated at a time when inflation has uh, hasn't been beat but inflation has come down meaningfully the tightening cycle is largely over and the fed might need to ease real interest rates mo- much more than people expect in order to reaccelerate the economy in a downside in a downturn like those instruments are actually pretty attractive on a forward looking basis and so absolutely it gives you a sense uh, uh for tips as a as an asset class definitely something to to check out and, and think about today Hundred percent. I have nothing to add. That was fantastic, my friend. And then the one thing I would say is, um, you you mentioned something, and we'll we'll wrap it up here. You said something that I thought that really t- struck a chord with me because I do have a different take, and I'm, I'm very excited to kind of unpack this with you really briefly. You said uh, inflation and entrenchment uh, is is unlikely. It's unlikely that we have this sort of uh, inflation entrenchment in the, in this cycle. Can you give me a little bit of thoughts on that, and then I'll share kind of a, our thoughts on on our views, and maybe you can kind of poke some holes in my thesis. Yeah, well, I think um, I, I think the um, it is all around the nuance. I'd say this is a nuance point, which is, do I think it'll be a little harder for like you know the Fed's target is two percent. Let's just start there, trying to get to two percent. We've come a long way. Um, a big part of that is the relatively significant tightening that's occurred, which has created a relatively significant slowing of nominal GDP. Um, which has eased inflation pressures. The fight is not over. Um, and I think the the question the question that that sort of comes is, can we get inflation back durably to two percent in an environment where we don't see economic weakness? I think the answer to that is that will be challenging. Like we'll kind of get probably get stuck kind of here, right in the three, four ish range, and that's not really okay. If we experience, let's just say we had a no landing, soft landing type scenario, we would probably still have those inflationary pressures emerge. I think the issue is that we've probably done enough to create a sufficient amount of monetary tightening to create that turn in the economy such that we get a weakening of the economy. And the weakening of the economy is the thing that put basically pushes us over the last mile in terms of the uh, the disinflation that's necessary to get to 
to the Fed target. And so that's kind of when I say there's not going to be a problem, it's more like I see a path and a set of connections in this future set of dynamics that I'm thinking about that would align with us getting to that 2%. But that path is with a recession ahead, not with a soft land. 100,000% agree. No disagreements there. Uh, the one thing I will add to that discussion is um, when we've been doing a lot of work with our institutional investor clients in recent months on trying to think, well, not recent months, really, last last couple of years. Um, you know, One thing we, we talked about at the beginning of last year was trying to help investors understand that, hey, this is an inflation shock. It is there are elements of this that are transitory, but there are also elements of this that are not transitory, uh, in our opinion, at least in our opinion, right? We'll find out in five to 10 years. Um, and so, Colin, if you throw um, slide eight, you know, one of the things we've been doing work on uh, in, in terms of our most recent macro scouting reports is sort of trying to connect the dots on the fourth turning. Are you familiar with the fourth turning, perchance? I, I've I've heard only references to it on Twitter. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's it's highly worth. I, it highly recommended. My former colleague Neil Howes, his former uh, late colleague Bill Strauss, uh, put out a book. Basically, uh, 1997, I think the original came out. Effectively, you know, you looking at the the, the geopolitical cycle through you know kind of economic or uh, ge um, demographic archetypes, and they noticed yeah. a sort of repeating pattern of throughout mm. history. And sort of this repeating pattern has explained a lot of like big things in American history, Civil War, Re American Revolution, World War II, yada, yada, yada. What, we, what I've tried to do in recent, in recent um, months is add some empirical analysis to that to help us better navigate what is the current fourth turning as investors. And so I just have a, a couple of brief slides on this. Um, Colin, if you could throw up slide 83 here. What we did was a big empirical deep dive uh, with data as far back as we can get it up to 1800 um, across a variety of key economic statistics to understand, hey, what does a fourth turning actually look like from the perspective of an investor? Not from the perspective of someone living in the economy, but from the perspective of an investor to give us a better roadmap, or not a roadmap, a baseline to adjust from as we get new information. And, and so the, when you look at this chart here, what we find is that you know, headline CPI tends to be relatively strong in these fourth turnings. And when, you know, when you look at the sort of median uh, range, the max mins on those on the statistics, and you, you tend to see a little bit more a lot of it more inflation on a, on a percentage change basis uh, relative to the baseline of first, second, and third turnings. And another dynamic that tends to happen in fourth turnings is you tend to see inflation spike. And so that's um, that's been pretty consistent. There's a lot of things that happen in fourth turnings from an empirical perspective, and I highly recommend uh, folks come check out this uh, presentation if they if they if they want to kind of get the deep dive and the, and the conclusions on this. But one thing we you know in the context of this backdrop, one thing we do know is that hey, look. Not we know, we don't know, sorry, I hate using the word no, no, we don't know nothing about the future. But one thing we think we know, us at 42 Macro, is that we have a lot of things that have changed in the economy as it relates to the, what we all kind of generally agree as economists as are the drivers of inflation that should contribute to a higher level of baseline inflation in the months, years, quarters ahead, months, quarters, and years ahead. And what we mean by the trend of inflation is just the, the line that the, the, the series oscillates around. Historically, in the yep. previous decade, that was about 1.6% for core PCE. If you look at the delta adjusted change in a lot of these variables that have all been proven to be correlated or co-integrated with CPI and various white papers, et cetera, what we find is that the change in these indicators suggests that this line, this horizontal line that inflation, core PCE inflation is oscillating around has but jumped up to 2.5 to 3.1%. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the context of a Federal Reserve that has a 2% price stability mandate, you know, that is a material change, assuming if they do not do something different in terms of their reaction function to above target inflation. And so I think, you know, maybe, you know, you disagree or agree, uh, you know, but we have this view that, yes, we are headed for a recession at some point. Yes, the recession will get inflation back down and that will high five itself. They'll cut rates, bonds will work, et cetera, et cetera. But the reaction outside the, after the recession, you know, kind of where inflation settles out, the, the trend of the time series is actually still going to be grinding higher over time. And in our opinion, that probably makes the ex ante returns in the bond market a lot less, a lot worse than we have previously experienced in, in business cycles where the trend of inflation was actually headed lower and lower over time. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. The the idea that um, the, the general point that, look, there's a number of these things that were big disinflationary trends that have like, you know, are likely to be less disinflationary or more inflationary in the future, which creates a, um, which will create a higher baseline, let's just say, or uh, or inflation level when things are neutral. 
um, I, I find quite compelling. Um, uh, and that that will, you know, uh, thinking about bonds and the return of bonds in an environment where inflation went from, you know, double digits to essentially zero sure, over the yeah. course of decades is not the appropriate, you know, perspective given that contextualization over the long term. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why I think tips is probably one of the most interesting asset classes, not just because um, because the real interest rates are so elevated, but also because to the extent that you get, you know, inflation that accrues that is closer to three versus closer to one and a half or two, um, you know, your tips benefit from that, right? And you and you don't have to do any work <laughs> for it. But I think that general idea of, uh, of, you know, the returns of bonds are not going to be like you've known them, uh, particularly nominal bonds are not going to be like you've known them, I think is, uh, is important for all investors to think about in their overall portfolio. And I guess as it connects to, to this uh, fourth turning thing, um, you know, I, 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 I sort of, I'll, I'll leave you, <laughs> leave, leave with this, which is, you know, I think in a lot of ways with the last couple of days and, and, and really the last like 18 months has also told us is that, you know, in a lot of ways, most investors are positioned very much for peace, mm -hmm. right? The 60, 40 portfolio has had a heck of a peace de dividend, right? It has a disinflation dividend, globalization and peace. And that, um, from a strategic portfolio perspective, you know, um, essentially holding 60 40 is essentially having a hundred percent view that we're going to have very low levels of international conflict. Mm. And, you know, if you look at it relative to I put something out on Twitter, which is like a 600 year history of human conflict, you know, we are at a very, very low secularly low by a couple orders of magnitude level of international conflict uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, which is essentially what we've all only experienced in our lifetime. And that, um, and that may not be the case in the future. And so being all in on, you know, no conflict and disinflationary pressures and globalization and all of that is not necessarily a good idea. And, and you can get a lot of bang for your buck in a strategic portfolio by holding some gold and holding some commodities uh, to help protect in the event that we have either increased geopolitical tensions or a structurally higher inflationary dynamic the way you're describing. Tom, I agree with you. Neil Howell agrees with you. And I think asset markets are starting very early starting in the to move in that direction yeah of agreeing with you this has been fantastic man i just want to say thanks again you're a brilliant guy uh doing a lot of great work in terms of democratizing finance uh where can we send people to go find you yeah um probably the best if you if you're interested in the macro side of things is uh checking out my twitter uh very active there at bobby unlimited um and then uh, uh if you want to learn more about what we're doing uh, around democratizing the two and 20, uh, investment return space, uh, check us out at unlimitedfunds.com. Appreciate you, Bob. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. I will catch you back here next month. And now I'm embarrassing myself because I don't remember who's next. Oh, Andy Constant, our friend over at uh, damp spring advisors. So Perfect. It's going to be a good, uh, good, another good discussion. Appreciate y'all. Cheers. <laughs>